And we're recording. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Lake Friendly Living webinar series, our fifth session this evening, Lake Friendly Landscape Maintenance for All Seasons. Hosted by New Hampshire Lakes and presented by our uh, partners, um, the experts at Belknap Landscape Company. And I see a lot of friendly faces out there, so you know the drill by now. But for those of you who are new to this series, this session is being recorded. Uh, participants, you are muted for the duration of the webinar, just as a good uh, crowd control best practice. I know you guys have things going on in the background there. We want to be able to hear our experts this evening loud and clear. You are welcome to leave your camera on or not, but if you do leave it on, just remember that other people can see you. Please submit questions as we go along this evening in the chat box. Everyone will see your question and uh, folks from the New Hampshire Lakes team, New, uh, Crystal and Jessica, will be answering their questions as they can as the presentation goes on. And at the end of the presentation, we'll um, refer any questions, um, common questions or questions that we just couldn't answer to our experts and have them uh, weigh in. This session, again, is being recorded and it will be posted on our website uh, by tomorrow morning and you'll get um, a email tomorrow morning with a link to, to view it. And after this session this evening, probably around 8.15 or so, you should get a email from us, an evaluation. Let us know how the session went. So let us know what you liked, um, how it could have been better and things you wanna to hear about in the future. So your host this evening, um, myself, Andrea Lamoureux, I'm the Vice President of New Hampshire Lakes. Crystal Costa is our Conservation Program Coordinator and Jessica Sayers, our Conservation Program Assistant. They are on the, the session this evening and again, they'll be manning the chat box. And the three of us make up our Lake Smart team at New Hampshire Lakes. For those of you who are new to New Hampshire Lakes, we are a member supported statewide nonprofit organization um, and we are the voice for all of New Hampshire's 1000 lakes. And our mission simply put is to help keep our lakes clean and healthy now and in the future. And we work with partners, folks like Belknap Landscape. Uh, we work with DES, um, the state agency and lots of local lake associations and individuals and state representatives. We try to promote clean water policies and responsible use and really inspire the public uh, to care for our lakes. Again, uh, this is a uh, one way we're doing outreach this summer, sort of shifting gears a little bit. Um, and for those of you who have been with us, I'm pleased to announce, thanks to your feedback, we will be hosting another webinar series in July, Working for Clean and Healthy Lakes. And that, read, that information just went on our website today and, and registration is live. So get a chance, please go register for that. And, We'll talk about all sorts of topics that you all have told us through this, this series that you wanted to hear about. So again, this, this series is part of our Lake Smart program. If you haven't um, tuned in yet, Lake Smart uh, is an education, evaluation, and recognition program, free, voluntary, and non-regulatory. Simply put, it's a program to help property owners um, learn um, how lake friendly they are living and give them some ideas for more lake friendly ways they could live and manage their property. And again, Bell Knapp here tonight will be talking to you about some lake friendly landscape maintenance tips and tricks. And if you haven't already, um, the first step to becoming Lake Smart is to take our online property owner self-assessment and you will receive a link to that in the email tomorrow. It's about a 30 minute question um, survey online, asks you a bunch of yes or no or true or false questions about um, your activities and how you manage your property. And then at the end of that, you have the opportunity to invite um, our team to come visit with you at your property. Um, or um, send in photos so we can get a better look. So if you haven't taken that already, uh, please do. And again, you'll get a, an official link to that tomorrow. But with no further ado, I am so pleased to have our friends and guests, um, experts back from Belknap Landscape. For those of you who have been following this series, they presented um, in our second session 
um, getting the landscape, the lake friendly landscape that you, you want. And tonight they're going to talk about some more sort of routine, you know, how to care for your, your landscape um, in a lake friendly way. And we have Andrew Morse, Peter Schmidt, and Jeff Searles. And Belknap Landscape is a full service landscape company that's been serving the Lakes region for over 30 years and they specialize in high quality design, permitting, project management, construction, irrigation, maintenance, tree services, and more. So without any more delay, um, we'll turn this over to Jeff. And Jeff, you should be able to share your screen. There it is. Okay, can you see my screen all right? Perfect, thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm Jeff Searles, as mentioned. Um, some of you may recognize me from the, the prior Lake Friendly Landscapes webinar that we did. Uh, today, we're going to talk about maintaining your landscapes in a way that is lake friendly. Uh, and as mentioned, I'm joined by um, Andrew Morse, who's the head of our recurring department. Andrew, if you could just say hello so people recognize your voice. Hello, this is Andrew Morse. Uh, happy to be a part of this tonight. And Peter Schmidt, who is a ISA certified arborist with us. Peter, if you could say hi. Welcome everyone, thanks for being here. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So I'm starting off this, this presentation the way I started off the last presentation, and that's to talk about runoff. Runoff is definitely one of the biggest concerns uh, regarding how your landscape can affect the lake. Uh, runoff can introduce uh, sediment, chemicals, and other materials into the lake, which have an adverse effect on water quality. Uh, good landscaping practices are aware, careful and creative. We're aware of how our current landscapes may be affecting the lake and aware of how changes that we make may affect the lake. We're careful with decisions that we make and we take care in our actions, both taking care legally but also being socially responsible. Finally, we're creative. We find solutions which give us desired outcomes while being mindful of the lake. There's more than one way of doing things in landscaping a lot of the time and tonight we're going to talk about some of the ways of doing things that uh, are more lake friendly. A good landscape maintenance program can reduce the introduction, introduction of chemicals to the watershed and encourage healthy plant life to mitigate runoff and erosion. So right out of the gate, there's two departments for the state of New Hampshire that have a lot of influence on what you're going to do to maintain your property. Uh, on the, on the lake. The first is the Department of Environmental Services. Uh, they have rules and regula regulations designed to protect the lake. They enforce these through a permitting and site review process for landscape construction, um, an application and practice parameters for maintenance services. And for the DIYers out there, I've included the link to the DES website. In addition is the Department of Agriculture who also has rules and regulations regarding application of and qualifications for applying pesticides. Um, they also control permitting and there's a number of different permitting and licensures for the application of pesticides. The most common for the homeowner is a general use permit and more information on the Department of Agriculture can be found on their website, which linked, the link is also provided below. So we're going to talk about a number of things. We're going to talk some about land, uh, lawn care. We're going to talk about caring for your trees. We're going to talk about caring for the, the other plant life on your property. And we're going to talk about snow and ice removal and mitigation for the winter. Um, and I thought we'd start off with one of the big ones, and that is lawn care. Uh, and specifically, some things you can do to care for your property without using chemicals, because um, one of the best ways to ensure that you are uh, being as lake friendly as possible is to reduce or eliminate the amount of chemicals that you are introducing to your property. If there's no chemicals introduced to your property, they're not gonna wash into the lake. You don't need to worry about them washing into the lake. 
uh, one of the best things that you can do for your lawn is mulching. Mulching is an excellent way of reintroducing the nutrients into your lawn that you may otherwise be removing when you remove uh, lawn clippings. When you decide to do a mulching program, one of the first things you're going to want to do is make sure that your mower uh, and the blade in your mower is capable of mulching. Most but not all mowers and blades can mulch. Now with that said, the vast majority of them that you will have purchased within the last, geez, 10 to 15 years anyways, uh, will have the capability. Before you mulch, you're going to want to check your thatch layer um, to make sure that you don't have too much thatch on your, on your, uh, your turf um, so that the, the nutrients from the, the mulch can, can make their way into, uh, into the soil. Um, there are going to be times when you shouldn't mulch. Um, you shouldn't mulch and you should bag and remove lawn clippings whenever you're mowing particularly tall grass. And the reason for this is you want the blades of grass that you're reintroducing to your turf to be pretty small. And if you're mowing particularly tall grass, it's really tough for even a really good mulching mower to get those, those clippings small enough to make their way in uh, to the turf. You're not going to want to mulch uh, if you're mowing over diseased areas or weeds because you can be introducing um, those to different areas of the property and exacerbating uh, an existing condition. Um, and if you're mowing over leaves or other materials, you're going to want to bag those up as well. Um, ideally, you're going to be mulching in um, pure grass back into your, uh, your turf. Andrew and uh, Peter, do you have anything you'd like to add when it comes to mulching? Uh, Jeff, I think you made a pretty good point with um, making sure you don't mow when the grass is tall because that, that's the key is, is to mow on a regular basis so that those clippings are small. That's definitely a question we get all the time of or a request to, to bag as we mow so that they don't see clumps on their lawn. But if you mow on a regular basis, um, you can avoid that. And, uh, and when, when those clippings are very fine, they're they break down uh, very quickly and, and are gone within a couple days. So it's, 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 if you do it properly, it's not unsightly either, as well as healthy. Sure. And uh, I, I think it's also worth mentioning that a lot of the tips that we're going to be giving today um, are designed to be lake friendly. But with that said, I can tell you that I mulch the grass at my house. Um, I believe uh, Andrew does as well. They're good. These are good tips uh, in general as well but we've definitely leaned them to being uh, lake friendly practices. So I, I, I do have one thing to add sure. with regards to, to, to mulching. So just to clarify the mulching is uh, you're cutting the grass and you're leaving the blades in place. And the blades are specifically designed to help push those blades of grass down towards the surface of the soil. So in doing this, uh, most people don't know this, but you can actually reduce your nitrogen input by about a third if you're leaving your your clippings during the season. So that means a third less um, nitrogen that could could uh, possibly wind up in the lake. So that's that I call that a nitrogen budget. So that that's a that's a big difference. Very, very good point. Uh, so moving on, uh, we, we also encourage that you dethatch, aerate, and overseed annually. Um, if you don't know what thatch is, I've included a picture there and you can kind of see where it's uh, laid out. Um, thatch is a natural, healthy part of a lawn, um, but it can become too thick. And if it becomes too thick, uh, it creates a barrier for the absorption of water and nutrients. And if we know anything about runoff, we really don't want to create a barrier for the absorption of water. Uh, so we suggest that you dethatch uh, your lawn in the early spring or early fall when the turf grasses are growing and the soil has moderate moisture. Um, you're not going to want to dethatch, you know, this time of year. Your lawn's already dry enough. If you remove that thatch, you're going to, you're going to really uh, put a hurt on that, uh, on that lawn. Next is aeration. An aeration of lawns introduces holes into the topsoil 
and these holes allow for water and nutrients to pass easier into the soil beneath the grass and thatch layers. So aeration is good for a couple of reasons. Number one, it makes your, your lawn healthier because it, it makes it easier for those nutrients to pass into the soil. But number two, it helps water pass into the soil as well. Again, we're looking to compact, we're looking to combat uh, runoff and a good way of com combating runoff is to absorb that water. Um, for both dethatching and aeration, dethatching can be done with a rake uh, or a power dethatcher. Um, and aeration, there's a couple of different ways. Um, most professional landscapers have the, the equipment, the power equipment to dethatch and, and aerate. You can also rent those um, from a lot of uh, rental companies to be able to dethatch and aerate. Um, Finally, we, we recommend overseeding annually to introduce new turf grass into your lawn to help assure good coverage and color. And overseeding has the best results when done in the fall, ideally accompanying dethatching and aeration. Uh, Andrew and Peter, do you have anything you'd like to add in regarding dethatching, aeration, and overseeding? I, I do. Uh, th to me, thatch, uh, excessive thatch is uh, an indication of an imbalance in the soil. And from my experience, this, this would indicate that there's a lack of biological activity, which normally breaks down that organic matter, which is accumulated on the surface. And there's some specific ways to deal with that. We probably don't have time to get, get into that right now, but compost top dressing is a, is a good way to do that. Okay. And compost top dressing, speak of, uh, speak of it, and we're going to talk about it. So adding compost, otherwise known as top dressing, um, is, is adding compost to the, the very top of the soil, and lawns benefit from the added nutrients compost adds to the soil. We suggest doing this one to two times a year, again in the spring and fall. Uh, you're going to notice a lot of again in the spring and fall, and a lot of that has to do with the moisture content and the temperature um, that your lawn is experiencing. Um, you, can, you can do a top dress when you're accompanying a dethatching, aeration, and overseeding, uh, and that could be a good time to do a top dress. Uh, you're gonna wanna spread the compost to be no more than a half inch thick, but you're really shooting for a quarter inch thick. Um, you, you want the compost to uh, not be so thick that it, uh, it again creates a barrier um, for moisture and nutrients to get into the soil. But again, if you over apply, that, that is a recipe for having a runoff. If there's, if there's too much product there, the excess may eventually turn into runoff. And you're gonna want your compost consistency to be fine grained with little to no clumps in excess of a half inch. And what this will do is this will help it penetrate down into the, uh, into the soil getting those good nutrients into the soil uh, and making your, your plants uh, on your turf a lot more healthy. Uh, Andrew or Peter, anything to add? Yeah, just uh, if people do go out and want to buy compost for their lawn to make sure that they're buying the appropriate compost for lawn, because as, as you've noted, it is a, a finer material that can sometimes be spread in a spreader, um, but it's, it's not you need to, to do your homework and make sure you're getting the proper compost for, for uh, lawn top dressing. Okay. So some, some other general maintenance for lawn care without chemicals. First, do not overcut or overwater your lawn. Mowing frequency is one of the biggest influences on turf, for turf grass health. And you should never remove more than a third of the grass at a time. Uh, this is called scalping and it is a good way of killing your grass. Um, it doesn't matter how tall your grass is, you should really be sticking to that one third or less rule. Uh, it, ideally, you're gonna set your mower to the highest setting and increase your frequency of mowing. Weekly mowing is commonly a good rate, but environmental factors will influence this. Um, and a lot of that has to do with how much your lawn is growing. Right now, it's, it's very dry out there. 
Um, so your grass may not be growing at a rate where you're going to want to mow it um, weekly. And of course, do not mow grass when it is wet. You're going to, you're going to tear up your grass. Uh, you're going to create areas um, of, of dead areas, ruts, so on and so forth. Um, water frequent, watering frequency is the uh, biggest influence or one of the biggest influences on root health. For lack of a better way of putting this, and maybe uh, Peter or Andrew can correct me if I'm wrong, but the way that I see it is you want your plants to be able to get to water, but you want them to stretch. You want them to really reach down deep and try to get to that water. And the further they reach down, the, the healthier they're going to be. And you know what? Those roots are going to create voids and areas in the soil to allow for better water absorption, to combat runoff. Overwatering can lead to runoff, uh, discourage root, root growth in depth, and encourage fungal and disease growth. Ideally, you want to water um, only when your turf needs it, and do it in the early morning hours. Um, Peter, Andrew, anything to add about uh, watering and cutting? Boy, uh, go ahead, Andrew. <laughs> I was just going to say that normally we're at three inches or so when we cut, but we've moved stuff to three and a half with this uh, drought uh, conditions that we're going through right now. Um, and you will see turf go into dormancy. Um, and But don't be alarmed. It will come back um, after we get through some of this this unprecedented uh, heat, but definitely the, the, the taller you cut it, that's also going to promote root growth deeper as well, too. Um, it kind of the top matches the bottom, so to speak. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great point. The, uh, the, the blades of grass actually are at least 50% of the uh, storage area of, of each grass plant. And uh, the other point I wanted to make sure everyone knew is if you're scalping your lawn, if you're cutting it down two inches, inch and a half, goodness forbid, uh, one inch, that direct sun exposure onto the soil not only dries it out faster, but weed seeds will definitely capitalize on germinating because they need direct um, sun exposure in order to germinate. So lots of reasons to mow at the correct height, at least three inches plus. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what if you decide to use chemicals and introduce chemicals uh, to your lawn. Um, first, if you choose to introduce any substance to your lawn, chemicals, um, we talked about this with compost, so on and so forth, it's important to be mindful of the application rates, setbacks from the waterfront, and your environmental conditions. Uh, you don't want to just, you want to think about this and be a little well educated before you get started. It's a good idea to apply any substance to your lawn or plants with an application rate of one third what the manufacturer suggests and reapply one to three times as needed over several days or weeks. Uh, that's gonna help combat waste. It's gonna help curb non-absorption and you may find that you don't need to continue uh, to a second or third application applications on lawns are best absorbed after dethatching and aeration. If you think about what dethatching and aeration does, you can kind of get an idea why uh, you're going to want to apply after those, uh, those things. Organic fertilizers are preferential to chemical applications. They can still have adverse effects on water quality and should not be used in excess. Um, we, we see this uh, periodically where people believe that well, it's organic, so I can do whatever I want with it because it's organic. Uh, that's not the case. You still need to be responsible uh, with the use of organic materials. Uh, Peter or Andrew, anything to add? No, not no. That was good. Excellent. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, setbacks and some things to understand about the use of chemicals. Uh, first, no pesticides can be used within 50 feet of a body of water, 10 acres or larger, or adjacent to a fourth order 
or larger stream or river. And this is from the Department of Agriculture of the state of New Hampshire. Uh, let me first start off by saying when I read that, I thought, well, what's a fourth order stream or larger? I've got no idea. The good news is you can go to the um, Department of Agriculture or the Department of Environmental Services website and do a search and they have a map. And you can see um, where, where the you know, fourth order streams are. And for those that don't know, basically a fourth order stream, the way it goes is a first order stream is where the, uh, the water uh, begins. So that would be at a, a spring or a melt off. And when two first order streams combine, you get your second order stream. When two second order streams combine, you get your third, so on and so forth. Uh, but it's a good idea, especially if you have a stream running through your property, just do five, 10 minutes worth of, of homework and figure out what order stream you have. Uh, regarding bodies of water that are 10 acres or uh, less, uh, 10 acres or less, a minimum of 25 feet setback is required. Uh, but this could be greater based upon your individual town uh, laws. This also includes organic pesticides that have an EPA registration number. So just because it's organic doesn't mean you can do whatever you want with it. Look on the bag, see if there's an EPA registra registration number and follow those guidelines. Uh, moving on to fertilizers. No fertilizer can be used within 25 feet of a body of water, 10 acres or larger, or adjacent to a fourth order um, or larger stream. This includes phosphorus-free fertilizers or organic fertilizers that have a nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium rating. Uh, we had discussed this in the last webinar, but you know what? If you had a 25-foot buffer of, of forested land or planting, you wouldn't necessarily need to worry about applying chemicals to a lawn there because there wouldn't be a lawn there. Uh, there are no express setbacks for the use of lime or wood ash. Um, and you need to be mindful of public water supply setbacks. In New Hampshire, a lot of public drinking water um, comes from lakes. And if you were on a lake that has an intake um, for public drinking water, the uh, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services mandates a 250 foot setback of any pesticide within a five mile radius of this intake. Uh, and that can be rather complicated, uh, but if you live on a lake, it'd be, it'd be wise to know, number one, uh, do any municipalities get public water out of that lake? And if so, where is that intake? Uh, Andrew or Peter, anything to add? Uh, just if anybody has any questions, if they're within that setback or need help explaining what that setback is, I'd be more than happy to um, to handle that, you know, afterwards, um, because you're right, it is somewhat confusing because it's not a true five mile radius around the whole intake. It's, it's, it's a portion of it that the DES has, um, mapped out nicely, but it, it can be, um, somewhat confusing. And you'll notice on the bottom of the screen here, um, there's another link and that link goes uh, specifically to some publications that the Department of Agriculture has that can help educate you on these setbacks, uh, so on and so forth. Another thing that I wanted to stress about setbacks is these are, uh, these are minimum setbacks set by the Department of uh, Environmental Services or Department of Agriculture. They're not necessarily a guideline or an endorsement. Sometimes it makes more sense to apply further back than the minimum setback. So we, being in this industry, we, we tend to get um, some questions and here's a handful of common questions we, we wanted to address right out, right out of the gate. First is, is an insecticide a pesticide? Uh, yes, yes it is. Uh, pesticide is the overall category for herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides. Next, can my round one fertilizer that prevents crabgrass be used within 50 feet of the water since it's a fertilizer? No, it can't because it's not only a fertilizer, 
It also contains a pesticide. Do I need to worry about setback laws with organics? Yes, for the reasons that we stated prior and because organics can also have a detrimental effect on the lake water quality. Uh, we get this uh, periodically in uh, why, how does my neighbor have such a green plush lawn all the way up to the waterfront? And there could be a couple of reasons for this. One could be they work really, really hard and they put a lot of time and effort into this and they've got a lot of people, maybe they hired a company and they're spending all kinds of money to encourage that company to work really, really hard. Maybe they planned very carefully and they were careful with the soils that they introduced to their property and the seed they used and so on and so forth. Maybe the conditions are different on their property or maybe they're just lucky. Or it's not unheard of for people to sometimes make a mistake um, and do some things on their property that maybe they shouldn't be. Um, if, you, if you wonder why your neighbor has such a, a plush lawn, ask them. And uh, if they're honest with you, you, you need to make that decision on whether that's something you're willing to do. Um, I can tell you that my neighbor has a beautiful lawn um, and I'm jealous of his lawn, but I'm not gonna work as hard on, uh, you know, I, I do this for a living. I'm not gonna do it in my spare time as much as he does, he's retired. So that's, you know, that's something to consider as well. And finally, as long as I follow the setback laws, I'm good, right? Well, no, and we've, we've alluded to this and I, I wanna bring it up again. The following setback laws may keep you out of legal trouble, but they don't guarantee that you're being lake friendly. You need to look at your property conditions with things like slope, natural or garden buffers on your property uh, in between the lake and a lawn or, or other areas. The condition of your turf, now you apply chemicals and other variables have influence. Sometimes um, more so than the setback or distance. If you, have, uh, if you have a property that the soil is very compacted and it is steep going to the lake, that 25 uh, foot uh, setback is legal, but I can tell you that you're going to see runoff um, just based on the, on the conditions. So definitely take a good hard look at that. Uh, Andrew or Peter, anything you'd like to add? Uh, Peter, maybe um, you want to expand upon the, uh, the compost tea conversation we had earlier with uh, in relation to um, what some organics that we can use right up to the waterfront. Absolutely. Um, you know, Jeff had just mentioned, uh, I believe in the last slide, anything that has an analysis, that's NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. We have alternate uh, tools at our disposal, which do not have that analysis. And by and large, these materials have extremely low nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So you might ask yourself, what's okay, what's the value of using those? Well, the value is, is that these materials tend to be more what we call soil conditioners. I like to call them biological food resources. So when we're, we're using these materials, we're helping to create a proliferation plur, of biological activity, which is a very good thing. And this, this biology acts as a buffer. It, it catches excess nutrients by multiplying and not allowing it to, to, to run off into the lake. So th these, are, these are very, very good, very responsible choices to make as an alternative to uh, you know, these you know, chemical NPK uh, fertilizers. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next we're going to talk about soil pH uh, and what to know so it will grow. Um, so if your soil conditions um, do not lend themselves to growing whatever you're trying to grow, whether that be a lawn or plants or, or whatever, um, you're not going to have much luck. Uh, so before you get started on any type of regimen, it's a good idea to, to measure um, the acidity in your soil. So soil pH uh, is a measure of acidity or alkaline assigned a numerical figure. 
Uh, you can measure it with kits or tools commonly available at retailers um, that sell garden supplies. There are services where you can send out your soil sample and they will do that for you. Uh, UNH used to do this, but I don't believe that they do anymore, but I, I believe UMaine still does and a couple of others. You're gonna find that lawns thrive best uh, with a soil pH level between 5.8 and 7.2, and that's relatively common around here. Um, other plants vary, but a 6.5 is a good general guideline for most of the plants in our area. You can adjust the, the acidity or alkaline of your soil by adding uh, amendments. Lime, for example, will com commonly used will increase the uh, soil pH uh, level. Sulfur will lower it. Uh, another thing to consider is if you have soil which is highly acidic or highly uh, alkaline, you might want to consider instead of introducing a bunch of soil amendments that may get washed into the lake, uh, maybe take a look at the plants that you're going to use instead and plant, uh, and plant materials that will thrive in that type of soil. Uh, Peter, Andrew, anything you'd like to add? You, you very commonly see uh, folks overdo it with lime. So that drives the pH, it drives up your alkalinity. Um, the, the problem is you can counter that alkalinity by applying sulfur, but it takes a very long time to acidify. It takes a very short amount of time to, uh, to, to, to raise your pH. So you're better off uh, a test is a very uh, inexpensive thing to do. Okay. So next we're going to talk about caring for your plants and trees. Uh, your plants and trees are exceptionally important to mitigating runoff and supporting a uh, good water quality. All of the plant life on your property is very important and that's why we're talking about how to best care for it. A good care program for your plants uh, may include pruning to encourage growth, mulching to help the soil uh, retain water and discourage weeds. And we're talking about bark mulch here. We're not talking about lawn mulch. Um, and an annual inspection for damage or disease. If you want to be lake friendly and you want to get rid of weeds, I hope that you are okay with uh, doing it by hand because that is by far the best way of doing it. Um, if you choose to utilize fertilizer for your trees or shrubs, the deep root method tends to be more effective and is typically more lake friendly. Uh, a good way to envision this is you're not fertilizing um, by spreading fertilizer along the top of the soil. You're injecting fertilizer into the soil and that helps reduce runoff substantially. Water sparingly, only when needed. Consider using drip irrigation as it's less likely to create a runoff concern. Uh, and then once the ground is saturated, stop. In the late fall, utilizing burlap, wing or snow shields, mulch or other methods to shield your plants from the harsh winter effects can reduce winter die off. Uh, winter die off is especially a concern on waterfront properties because uh, the, the amount of wind and the harsh conditions right on the lakefront um, are not conducive to a lot of plants surviving the winter without at least a little die off. And I, I've said this in the, in the past webinar and I'm going to repeat it. If you want to have the most success in having uh, good plants on your property that are going to survive, native plants are by far the most viable choice for our climate and waterfront properties. They've evolved to survive here. Um, Peter or Andrew, any questions that you, any uh, things you'd like to add? Well, I, I, I guess as the arborist here, I guess I have to jump in. <laughs> so roots, particularly tree roots, act as an excellent biofilter, okay? So toxins, excess runoff, Roots make a very, very good way of filtering out these toxins and attached to these roots are beneficial fungi, bacteria, protozoa, nematodes. There's a lot of different uh, very beneficial organisms that are happening beneath our feet. 
and and Jeff, you you touched on uh, winter um, desiccation. That's the the drying winds, the winter injury we see on unprotected plants. Probably one of the best things you could do is make sure, is particularly your evergreens are properly irrigated, right up to the point where the soil freezes. Um, once the soil freezes, evergreens have no means of taking up additional water during the winter, and that's what that's why we see a lot of damage. Uh, one one of the comment I have is uh, when when we're talking about mulching, uh, I I I personally use wood chips. Um, I don't mind the look of them. Uh, I, I I like that natural look, but I but the amount of uh, worm activity that is underneath all the wood chips, especially around my fruit trees or any of my plants, is 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 unbelievable compared to um, regular bark mulch. Um, and I do believe it allows more rain to get through to the roots of the plants as well too. So I would highly encourage um, the use of wood chips as, as a mulch. Okay. So we've got a certified arborist on the call. So I would be remiss if I didn't at least talk about trees a little bit more. Um, and again, and Peter, Peter brought this up, but trees are especially important for the, uh, how, how lake friendly your property is to the point that if you are looking to do something with your landscape and you go to get a permit, you need to have a tree survey done um, so that we can see that um, we aren't removing uh, too many trees and where we're doing what's best for the lake. Uh, so it's, if you wanna be lake friendly, you really need to keep an eye on the health of your trees. Um, so here's some things generally that you can do um, at least annually, maybe, you know, a little more often to take a look at this, to check on the health of your trees. You want to look for missing foliage and damaged or sagging limbs uh, annually. Look for evidence of a pest infestation. Look for areas of discoloration, fungal growth, and mold on your trees. Is your tree leaning? Uh, and if it has an existing lean, has that lean become more pronounced? Uh, check for damages, cracks, or splits in the trunk. And are there damaged or exposed roots? Um, a lot of times, and, and Peter, I'm sure, can speak to this, but uh, trees, as with a, a lot of uh, things, if you, if you are able to catch problems early on, your success rate for being able to resolve those problems and save your trees is significantly higher. Um, and I may, be, I may be partial to this, especially because we have Peter on the call, but if you see evidence of damage, uh, pest concerns, um, hazardous conditions, something like that, you really should reach out uh, to a certified arborist. There's a lot of companies in the area um, that are tree companies uh, and they specialize in removing trees and taking off limbs and so on and so forth. They perhaps don't specialize in saving trees or understanding the, uh, the health and, and needs of a tree. Uh, and that's where an arborist really comes in. That's the difference. Um, Peter, please tell me you have things that you want to add to this. I, I do. And, and uh, you know, on a, on a day like this that we had, what's better than um, seeking refuge in the shade of a nice, a nice, old, nice old shade tree, huh? Um, but we shouldn't be complacent about trees. Um, they, they can be um, dangerous under certain conditions. Um, I'm, I'm a big advocate of performing uh, tree risk assessments, which should definitely be left to a certified arborist. I find uh, trees very commonly, they look very healthy, but they are not safe. So just like a dentist sometimes will say, hey, this tooth has to come out. Sometimes, unfortunately, I have to say, look, this tree is unsafe, it has to go. Um, that's not a very uh, happy thing for me to do, but uh, my, my, my de dedicated my career to caring for trees and uh, to, to sum up what I do, I balance the needs of uh, trees and people and uh, hopefully find a happy medium so that we can coexist. Okay. So now we're going to talk about erosion. So 
there's more that uh, a landscaper does than necessarily just go onto your property and, and complete a bunch of tasks. A good landscaper is going to really look at your property and understand what's going on. And if there's problems or concerns, they're going to bring it to your attention. Um, if, you don't, if you don't employ a landscaper, then it's a good idea for you to take a look at your property and try to recognize problems and concerns as well. Specifically for the lake, I wanted to talk about runoff and erosion concerns. These are just some general guidelines to look for. Uh, one of the most expressive illustrations of runoff or erosion problems is exposed earth, areas where plant life or ground cover has been disturbed or washed away. Erosion typically is expressed in unstable areas on a property. Uh, this can be expressed through areas where the earth is breaking apart, receding, losing its cohesion uh, with the surrounding areas. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're seeing, you know, clumps of earth fall off. It could be an unstable area. It could be, you know, a, a crack is formed somewhere. Um, anything that is, is a change, if there's a change in, in the, your property, uh, there's movement. Something's going on there. Uh, runoff can be expressed in areas where sediment is accumulating. Look for a convergence of sediment in an area in the water along the shore, perhaps in a bend or a turn along a pathway or lower, low spots on your property. Uh, and finally, one of the best ways to figure out what's happening with the water and if it's creating erosion or runoff on your property is to, to go out and walk your property when the water is there. Consider taking a walk in the rain. That's the best way to understand how the excess water is being shed from your property. Uh, it can help you. Um, it can help you learn where you have uh, problems. It can help you figure out where the water is going, if it's carrying anything off, so on and so forth. Inspecting your property during a rainstorm will help you realize a better understanding of any concerns you may be experiencing. Uh, Andrew, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, no, not really. I, again, um, observing it's probably a very, very good point of, of you know, seeing what's happening during um, a torrential downpour versus a, you know, a normal rain and, and, and taking action on that, um, you know, especially on lakefront, it's so important to, you know, we see it so many times that, um, you know, especially around construction sites where uh, proper action isn't taken care of and, and you just, it just, it's a complete runoff, but um, taking note of that and, and uh, observing that and, and taking the precautions ahead of time are, are very key. Okay. So we said that this was management, uh, property management for all seasons. So we're going to talk about snow and ice. The introduction of uh, snow and ice management materials to our local properties and roadways is a significant contributing factor to drinking and lake water quality concerns in our area. Um, I, I can't remember where I read, but I was astounded at the number of lakes that they, they say have significant pollution um, uh, caused by this. Uh, so specific concerns are primarily based upon the introduction of these chemicals and sediment into the watershed. Um, salt and ice melt typically, uh, typically, salt and ice melt products that typically remove ice through a chemical reaction, whereas sand and other sedimentary aggregates are primarily used to create traction on slippery ice surfaces. So you've got your salt and your ice melt, their job is to get rid of the ice your, uh, your sand and other aggregates, their job is to make things less slippery. Sometimes it's a good idea to determine, do I want to get rid of my ice or am I most worried about uh, having traction? Um, and the best way to protect our water quality is to properly manage and reduce the use of these materials. So in New Hampshire, um, the Department of Environmental Services and, uh, and uh, UNH and some other folks uh, have realized that this is a problem and they created a training and certification program called Green Snow Pro to assist in learning how to manage and reduce the use of these materials. So we, we are a Green Snow Pro uh, certified company as are a bunch of others. 
Uh, and I just wanted to take a moment to introduce to you what Green Snow Pro is. Uh, we won't spend a ton of time on this, but I do think it's important uh, for folks out there to know because there is a difference. Uh, the New Hampshire Green Snow Pro program focuses on ways to reduce the use of chemicals used to manage snow and ice during the winter. In order to become a certified Green Snow Pro uh, professional, you need to take a course and pass an examination that focuses on certain topics like how snow melt chemicals work, the negative effects of overuse on those chemicals, proper application rates of chemicals, how to adjust, set, and test your equipment for proper application rates, and certification must be renewed annually by attending uh, refresher courses uh, biannually. So you renew, you renew annually and you every other year you need to go to a course. Um, and Snow Pro certified companies must also track and report their chemical usage to the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Uh, I know that Andrew knows a, a fair amount about um, New Hampshire Snow Pro. Andrew, would you like to add anything to this? Yeah, I think one of the more important things to note here is uh, the, the top bolded item of how snow melt chemicals work. Part of that is knowing the forecast is, is we are constantly looking at the forecast to, well, hopefully they're predicting it right so that we know what's going to happen, meaning that is it going to be a, an ice storm or is it going to be a blizzard? Is it going to be 20 below or is it going to be, you know, above freezing when it's done? That helps us determine what we're going to use and how much we're going to use and the timing of that. Because again, the key is, is, to re, is not to eliminate the use of it mostly from a safety standpoint, but it's to reduce it greatly. And you, and you need to know, and part of this, a big part of this is, is knowing the forecast and knowing what different tools in your toolbox to use, meaning what different, there's many different types of salt um, or ice control uh, products, I should say, that work in different conditions. And you need to know, you can't just go out and throw down straight old rock salt when it's 30 below and think it's going to melt ice. It's not, it's not going to happen. And it's just a waste of product. And, and, and a lot of, of, a lot of, you know, the shopping centers and the big commercial properties that, um, have snow removal with catch basins, water flows downhill and eventually that that's going to end up in the lakes and streams. And it's, um, it's an excellent program that's bringing awareness. Um, and it's surprising when we first went through it, it's surprising how much less chemical or ice control products you can use to get the, 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 uh, the results you need. It's amazing. Okay. Um, and so Andrew had, had alluded to really understanding how these, um, how these chemicals work and planning ahead. Um, so salt and ice melts, they break down as they, as they work. And this uh, can be particularly troublesome because uh, they more easily dissolve in water, get absorbed into the ground, or are carried away in runoff. So the use of these materials, the goal 100% is to use as little as possible to achieve the needed results. And in order to use as little as possible, you, as Andrew said, you need to use the right tool for the specific job. So if you're thinking about your own property, you need to understand, like Andrew said, what exactly is going to be happening uh, during the storm and what tools should I use? Um, you also need to be realistic in what you need. Uh, what areas do you need to be ice free versus what areas do you need to be slip resistant? Uh, if you have a waterfront property and you have a, a driveway, do you really need your entire driveway to be uh, completely ice free? Or do, you, or do you need some areas to be ice free and the others uh, perhaps you could use a, a different uh, treatment that will, uh, that will give traction? So some things to know about uh, ice melts. As it gets colder, Snow and most ice melts become less effective at the temperature of 30 degrees. One pound of salt will melt 46 pounds of ice. But as the temperature drops, salt effects, effectiveness uh, slows to the point that when you get down to near 10 degrees, it's barely working at all. Uh, so it's kind of that situation where if it's, if it's at 10 degrees, why are you salting? 
uh, if it's not going to be effective. The other thing that I, I thought that was interesting here though is one pound of salt will melt 46 pound of ice. So when you go through New Hampshire Snow Pro, they, give, they, they teach you application rates. Um, and if you're a do-it-yourself and you maintain your own property, um, you can't really go through New Hampshire Snow Pro. It's a commercial uh, thing. But a little bit goes a long way. Uh, if one pound of salt will melt 46 pounds of ice, a lot of these... Uh, other snow melts, these commercial available pellets and so on and so forth, they're even more efficient. So you shouldn't be just throwing it down, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, willy-nilly. Uh, be responsible. You can always apply more, but you can't really pick it up once it's down there. Uh, Andrew or Peter, anything you'd, you'd like to add for using salt and ice melts? Well, Jeff, I was going to add that um, the Green Snow Pro program, programs, uh, not just for commercial, um, I would, it's, it's also for towns and municipalities. So I would encourage people to ask their town public works if, if they are, have gone through the course themselves for their roadways. Um, and also at these, uh, uh, seminars, we find a lot of, um, uh, universities and colleges that, that, uh, have people that attend it that become certified as well too. So it, it can be more than just the, the commercial landscapers out there doing snow removal, um, it's not required as of yet. Uh, hopefully someday it will be, but I would encourage everybody to, um, to look it up and talk about it with people that they know. Yeah, and you can, if, if you are hiring somebody and you want to know whether or not they're um, snow pro, you can go to the Department, of, uh, uh, the Department of Environmental Services website and just do a search for snow pro. It's one word. Um, and they have a list of, of what companies and who in that company is certified certified as snow pro now one thing that i would caution you is if you're hiring a pretty good sized company and they have one person who's snow pro certified i mean i don't i don't necessarily know about that i it's nice that they have one person but is that one person driving all of their you know their plow trucks um is that one person recalibrating all of their plow trucks so definitely do your homework so moving, uh, using sand. Uh, so sand is an effective way to make ice slip resistant. Uh, in order for sand to be effective, it must be applied to and remain on top of the ice. Sometimes what we, what we see with people that are using uh, sand is you have melt and refreeze and the, the sand will melt into the ice, the ice will refreeze and now it's, it's slippery again. Um, and as a result, uh, sand may need to be reapplied uh, regularly. Uh, sand does not dissolve in water, making it easier to manage and remove from your property after winter. Uh, sand can be carried in runoff, and as a result, anti-runoff efforts should be made, and we'll expand upon that in uh, the next slide, I believe. If you're going to use sand, and only sand because you want to be uh, lake friendly, uh, use only clean sand intended for the purpose of snow and ice management. Um, there are sands that contain other chemicals. Um, so you want to be mindful of that as well. Uh, Peter or Andrew, anything to add as far as using sand for snow and ice management? I'm good. Okay. So uh, managing your snow. The first thing you want to do is you want to be mindful of where snow is being plowed. As you're plowing snow, uh, it carries chemicals and debris uh, with it. And snow banks can create a concentrated area um, of chemicals and sediment. And as they melt, runoff is a concern in those areas. So ideally, your snow banks will be placed in an area that slopes away from the waterfront. Uh, and you're mindful of post-season cleanup efficiency. Sand, for example, uh, is most easily removed from paved or hard surfaces. Um, so we, again, if you're using uh, just sand. Snow and ice that is plowed into or allowed to accumulate on drainage features, such as catch basins, drains, swales, dry riverbeds, can render these features ineffective. So you could have all of the best intentions, uh, but if you were not plowing or storing your snow correctly, in the right areas, 
uh, you're mitigating all of the efforts that you've made. And you wanna make your snow and ice management plan in the fall. Walk your property with your service provider uh, and make note of areas where snow should be stored and the direction of plowing. Um, really be mindful of these things and have this figured out before the first snow flies. Um, we commonly uh, walk these the, you know, people's properties again, typically in the fall, early fall, uh, to really have that plan and address these concerns. Because after that first snow falls, for example, if you've got a catch basin and your service provider plows that in, well, you might not even know there's a catch basin there um, moving forward. Uh, Peter or Andrew, anything to add? Yeah, the, uh, the, the accumulation of uh, de-icing materials around bases of trees and shrubs can, can actually cause a great deal of damage. And we see, we see some of that every year. And it's not just limited to um, shopping centers and roadside trees. We, we do actually see that happen on uh, residential properties as well. Just something to be mindful of. Okay. So how to get started uh, for the do-it-yourselfers. Um, and this is kind of a review from the last one. So if some of you, please bear with me, but you're gonna wanna, if you wanna be as lake friendly as possible, you should really consider participating in the Lake Smart program uh, to learn about uh, changes that you can make to your property. Uh, local engineers uh, or surveyors uh, with working knowledge in your area can help you. You can utilize the available resources on nhlakes.org. Educate yourself on ice melting methods and alternatives. Get the right equipment. Snow blowers, for example, can reduce the accumulation of snow banks uh, and their respective concerns because you can blow the, you can control where the snow goes a little more easily if you have a smaller property. Uh, and plan ahead. Know your plan before the first snowstorm. If you're going to hire a professional, uh, again, not all professionals are qualified to work responsibly on waterfront or watershed properties. We strongly recommend that if you're going to hire a professional uh, to do your snow removal, to definitely go with Green Snow Pro, and I've attached the link there. Uh, experience matters. Look for a provider with a proven track record of successful and responsible service of waterfront and watershed properties. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, qualified landscape firms will be insured, hold multiple certifications and showing willingness to answer your questions about the qualifications. And walk your property with service provider, ask questions and ask how they will assure that their services will be performed in a lake friendly manner. And don't just ask them how, ask them to be specific. Uh, if they can't answer a specific question, um, they may just be placating you. Uh, Peter or Andrew, anything to add? No, it's well stated. Uh, and finally, about us again, um, this is the information about us. I won't go too far into depth because as a brand coordinator, I'm a Belknap Landscape Geek, and I can tell you all kinds of wonderful things. Um, but again, I just want to stress that one thing that really makes us different is who we are. And we have, a, we have a track record of being environmentally conscious and socially conscious when it comes to uh, the lakes and the conditions around us. Uh, we have been associated with the Long Squam Lake Association for years, Wentworth Watershed, Squam Lakes Natural Science Center, of course, NH Lakes, uh, Prescott Farm Environmental Education Center. Um, we don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk. Um, and that's what makes us different. Of course, you can see all of the other stuff, but I'm not here to hard sell you. We're here to, you know, to try to help make a difference for you and uh, help you be late friendly. Um, so at this point, if we have any questions, um, hopefully we can answer them. Awesome. Thank you all. I I learned so much, and I know that others have as well. Um, Crystal and Jessica have been manning the chat box and providing some really helpful um, supporting uh, links to documents and, and whatnot. And, and a couple questions um, were in the chat box, so I will turn it over to Crystal. 
Hi, uh, that was great. I was sitting over here like being like, roo, rah, rah, woohoo, <laughs> the whole time. Um, so thank you for touching upon um, so much good information. We only have a handful of questions right now. Maybe some more will come in through the chat box as we get started. Um, but the first question came really early on, and it's, uh, how do you look at your lawnmower and know if you have a mulching blade on there? Boy, well, if you bought it from a dealer, it, they probably either should have told you there was one or it would have been listed that it, it does come with one. But typically, they're not, they don't look like a normal straight blade. They have um, uh, three fins on them that curve up. And, and what that does is it has, Peter alluded to earlier, it drives, it, it makes the airflow under the deck drive the grass clipping down. So if you see a, a blade that has sort of um, yeah, fins in the back of it, that's, that's a, a, a mulching blade. Um, hmm. and, if, and if a mower has uh, mulching features on it, um, you're able to shut the deck so that the clippings don't blow out the side or whatever. Um, typically those, those and, and I'm thinking mostly about push mowers, those typically come with the mulching blades already. Um, or you can take a picture of it and bring it to, um, you know, the local uh, uh, lawn and garden uh, person that, that sells them and, and they could, they could tell you if it's, if it's one or not. That's a great idea. Um, for people that have lawn mowers, for example, we have a lawn mower that a friend found in their garage and gave to us. So uh, if we find out that we don't have a mulching blade on our lawn mower, can we retrofit it to add a mulching blade onto it? Ah, oh, boy, that's a good question. Um, there are some mowers that require special decks for mulching blades. And what I've seen in most cases, that may be more of the expensive um, mowers. I, from my experience, most like push mowers or homeowner mowers, ride on tractor style mowers, they, they are able to take um, uh, the mulching blades as far as retrofitting it, I don't think you have to do much other than, other than change the blade. But again, I would, I would ask that question um, first before you just go out and buy a mulching blade and think it can, can go on it because it, 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 it may not. Um, and it, I say some of the other more expensive mowers that it's just the way that they're designed um, to work. And uh, the, there are some that you have to buy a completely different deck for that to take the mulching blades. Um, but that's, that's a, that's a different discussion. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Um, the next question is about grubs. So most people don't realize that they have grubs until they start getting that, you know, patch of dead brown grass that seems to just keep growing. So for uh, property owners, uh, you know, living near the lake, uh, how do they get rid of their grubs in a lake-friendly manner? Now, I've heard of beneficial nematodes um, being lauded as a solution for that, but I wanted to throw that question to uh, you folks as the experts. Yeah, so the, this is an area I have, a, <clears throat> I have a lot of experience in. So there, there are more traditional methods of dealing with grubs, uh, insecticide applications. Of course, we're in that 50-foot buffer. We can't do that. So nematodes are beneficial, microscopic worms. And essentially what they do, if applied at the right time under the right conditions, they actually parasitize the grubs. So they'll inf infiltrate the grub's body and, uh, and, and kill it. This is typically done second, third week of August. So the timing is, uh, Perhaps not critical, but but fairly important to get it done during that time frame. Um, you, you can't really be applied on, on a day like this where it's really really hot. The UVs can can uh, render um, them ineffective, and they could they could die in the um, in the sun. So it's best if you do choose to use nematodes, and they do work if it's done properly. Irrigate before and after. Early in the morning is best or in the uh, latter part of the day. That's where we see the success. Very cool. So, you know, I had heard uh, about them, um, but it's, it's nice to hear 
from somebody with experience that uh, that, that it works. Um, predatory nematodes, that's hardcore. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another question uh, more, you know, uh, specifically to uh, the, the shoreland area. So, um, you know, the, through the Lake Smart program, we, you know, we want to make sure that uh, folks that like their property to look more manicured um, uh, are grouped into this, but also those that like their property to remain more natural for wildlife and things like that. Um, so for a lakefront property with a natural shoreline, um, you know, as recommended by the Shoreland Water Quality Protection Act. Um, what kind of regular maintenance, if any, do you recommend for those natural native buffers? Well, I, I think um, Jeff mentioned it earlier. First of all, is, is making sure that you have native uh, plants in there for that buffer zone, because typically if they're planted in the right environment, their upkeep should be minimal, mm -hmm. um, or at least that's, that's the goal. Um, we also talked about um, some deep root feeding with, with uh, organics earlier as well, too. And, and that's a, uh, again, and, and a lot of that's geared towards proper root growth. You want a good foundation before you put the, before you build the house. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a good maintenance thing to do, too. And then also, Jeff had mentioned uh, check, getting your pH checked. Again, pHs can change rapidly. And if you don't know what that is, then your, your buffer may not be successful. And it might be a minor adjustment enough to, um, you know, help those plants uh, get established uh, as well, too. And I, I probably would also say that, that there's also, depending on what that buffer is, uh, proper pruning techniques as well, too so that things don't get out of control and overgrown and then sh start to shade each other out. And therefore, you know, you know, the, the, that buffer starts to, to decline. Excellent. Um, you know, and I, I'm thinking what, what you were saying earlier about, um, you know, making sure that folks are thinking about uh, the health of their trees as well. Um, so just because you have uh, a buffer that is full of natives doesn't mean you can't be keeping an eye on it and um, pruning trees and shrubs accordingly to maintain airflow and things like that. Um, I think one thing that we observe a lot uh, through our site visits with the Lake Smart program is people thinking, oh, well, I have this, um, you know, this natural area of my property and I, I don't need to maintain it. And what we end up seeing is a lot of compacted areas from, from foot traffic and stuff like that. And so uh, we actually recommend that people start putting in some mulched footpaths and things like that to um, isolate the, the uh, areas experiencing compaction to reduce erosion over time. Um, so that's excellent. Uh, those were all of the questions that we got. I think that uh, it was such a jam-packed informational presentation, Jeff. That was an excellent job. Um, so if anybody has any final questions that they want to shoot in really quick through the chat box, please feel free to do so. Um, but I wanted to make a comment about snow storage. Um, and I was getting really excited during the, um, the uh, winter portion of your presentation, Jeff, because um, long ago, uh, when I took my first soak up the rain training um, with Lisa. Hi, Lisa, she's here with us today. Uh, the concept of uh, mindfully thinking about your snow storage, that, th that training was the first time that that had ever been presented to me. And uh, I'm sure for a lot of folks that attended this webinar, um, Jeff, hearing you say that might have been the first time that they thought about that as well. Um, so thinking about where you're putting snow on your property, planning for the winter, knowing that the things that you plant there can tolerate not only the snow plow, but the, you know, chemicals that come along uh, with the snow that's disposed there is um, a very important uh, part of a, you know, mindful property maintenance plan. So just thank you for uh, speaking to that because it's huge. We don't have any other questions coming in. So Andrea, I'm just going to send it back your way. Well, thank you all. Um, nice job, Crystal. Um, so uh, Jeff, Peter, and Andrew, any, any last words you wanted to share with our group this evening? 
no, again, it was, thank you for having us on. Uh, it, was, it was enjoyable. Mm, great. Thank you for having us. Yeah, we, we thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I, the, the wealth of knowledge that uh, could have been passed along. Um, <laughs> we were just scratching the surface. Um, I, at some point, would like to maybe talk about trees a little bit more. Um, if there's any interest, by all means, um, reach out to us. But yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, this has been great. And for those of you who are still with us, Jeff wrote an excellent article for our upcoming newsletter, uh, Lakes versus Lawns, and I think seven important things you need to know. So if you are a New Hampshire Lakes member, you will receive that uh, newsletter soon. Um, so again, this, these presentation, this presentation will be posted on our website uh, by tomorrow morning. You'll get an evaluation um, probably in the next few minutes. Let us know how we did. And uh, stay tuned um, or register today for our webinar series in July. So uh, thank you for joining us this evening. And thanks for all you guys do to help keep our lakes clean and healthy. Thank you. Thank Good you. Good night. Good evening.